Thanks for tuning into this week's Stacker Chat. Stacks is Smart Contracts for Bitcoin, and I'm joined by Muni Bali, Stacks founder, for your weekly updates. So some exciting news came out this week, more details on hyperchains. And we've been talking about hyperchains and the scalability that they can bring to Stacks for a little while. Um, but I wanted to start first by actually zooming out before we dive into some of the details. One of the things that we talk about a lot is how blockchains you know, make different trade-offs between performance and decentralization. Why does it matter that we build in layers and optimize for decentralization at the lowest levels to settle on Bitcoin? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a very important question. So if you if you think about um, a lot of kind of like different blockchains that came out in the last few years, there's a general trend that people are optimizing for faster speeds. And the question that a lot of people don't ask is that what is what is the trade-off that you're making, right? Like because in, in distributed systems, there are always trade-offs. There is no kind of like magic bullet. If you're trying to optimize for one thing, you're likely doing that by sacrificing something else, right? So I can, I can give a little bit of an extreme example uh, to uh, basically make it clear, like the difference between let's say Bitcoin or Stacks or uh, something that is highly centralized or uh, where mining is whitelisted to people who own data centers basically. Right. So you, you can't even be a miner on the network. Um, I won't name a blockchain, but, uh, but there are a bunch of these out there where it's, uh, you can't even be a miner on the chain and you need to have very high powered, uh, basically data center nodes that have a certain bandwidth connection uh, to, be able, uh, to be able to kind of like mine on that network, even if you quote unquote can call it mining. Right. So that's the spectrum, whereas Bitcoin or Stacks, like you could literally kind of like run a node on a Raspberry Pi and your internet connection could be anywhere in the world, right? Like a normal person on a laptop could run a, run a miner for Stacks, could, could actually be a full node participant. So I think that's, that's kind of like the spectrum of things. And we wanted to be more on the decentralization side of things because fundamentally uh, the way we approach kind of like, you know, Web3 on Bitcoin is effectively that your, your foundational layers need to be the most decentralized, right? Because you can always build faster, less decentralized things on top of more decentralized things, but not the other way around, right? If your core blockchain layer is heavily centralized, everything built on top is at risk of centralization if the underlying uh, blockchain is, is heavily centralized because it becomes kind of like a, uh, a single point of failure. So you can only go in one direction in a way uh, with this layered approach. Uh, you can keep adding like more decentralized layers or you can keep adding like slightly more centralized but faster layers. And that's, that's how we think about it. So the stacks is a programming layer. Uh, it optimizes for decentralization instead of speed and effectively gives you uh, fully, fully expressive smart contracts uh, in, in, in the programming layer. And now the work with hyperchains is effectively adding a uh, fast transactions layer. Uh, and I think I, I, we can get into some of the trade-offs that we are making uh, for the design of hyperchains and how that would enable the thing that a lot of developers and users seem to care about, which is really fast transaction speeds and really high throughput volume. So you should be able to do uh, a, a lot more traffic can actually uh, be processed and uh, the speeds could be much, much faster as well. And that's the experience that people have been having on, on, on a bunch of different chains. And I've come to almost like expect that experience uh, somehow without really digging deep into like what are the trade-offs and decentralization properties of, of those systems. Thank you. And can we dive a little bit deeper? Would you be able to share more details in terms of the hyperchain design, um, some of the use cases and what's being optimized for by developers building the hyperchains infrastructure? Yeah, so I think Hero Systems has taken a first crack at Hyperchains. So Hyperchains itself, it's a, it's a concept, it's an open source project, Any, anyone can contribute to it. And I believe a bunch of different companies, including Trust Machines, would, would try to contribute to the open source project. But it's great that Hero Systems has taken a first stab. They've kind of like gone ahead with uh, an initial implementation and put up, put up a timeline, which is, which is great to see. Uh, and the initial design is effectively uh, I think going back to earlier what I was talking about, there are a bunch of kind of like key properties that people should understand. One is that uh, who is allowed to mine, right? 
if you have an open membership system, anyone can come in and, 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 and be a miner. Like that's better for decentralization, but maybe at times not so good for speed, right? So let's say in, in a version of hyperchain, uh, you restrict the miners by the type of hardware that they have and the type of bandwidth connections that they have, or even in the very early versions, uh, you can even whitelist a certain set of miners who kind of like qualify and uh, for for running the initial version, right? So at that point, you're effectively uh, there is almost like a parallel layer of hyperchains that these miners are running, and it it becomes more about how are people transferring assets in and out of the hyperchain and the stacks main chain. So if you read the docs, there's a bunch of discussion around how assets would basically move into a hyperchain and then move out of, of the hyperchain. And what are the kind of like security uh, guarantees around, around these transfers? So in terms of use cases, uh, what you can imagine is that, let's say you're doing the new NFT drop, or you wanna build a DEX that where you expect like a lot of uh, trading transactions to happen on a, on a regular basis. So you can do these high volume type of operations on a hyperchain, right? So you do your NFT drop, uh, it's high throughput, uh, low latency, uh, you, you get your uh, drop done, and then people can actually withdraw the NFTs from the hyperchain to to the main chain. Uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a little bit like you know how uh, you, people would advise you that you shouldn't keep your assets on a, an exchange uh, for a long time, right? But you do transfer your assets there when you want to trade, and once you're done, you kind of like withdraw your assets. So obviously, hyperchains are going to be more decentralized than than a centralized exchange. But that's the rough analogy that people can have in mind, right? So once once we can play around with those parameters, the interesting thing about hyperchains is that there can be different configurations of these that can be launched over time. So the first one that that Hero System is looking at uh, is effectively a Clarity VM, so that you know the virtual machine is compatible with the Stacks mainnet, and effectively is is trying to give you faster speeds. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a network that's connected to the main chain. But you can play around with these things as well, right? Like for example, you can imagine uh, a different version where the miners, for example, can get elected uh, by active stackers, right? So in some ways, stackers can have an input on like who gets to mine on, on, on this hyperchain or further down the road, it's entirely possible that if some people want to program in a different language, right? This is, this is more uh, uh, hypothetical right now, but uh, you can have that support for that programming language in a hyperchain and then just do the transfers between a hyperchain and, and the stack mainnet, right? So that's, that's kind of like the general architecture. I think people who are more familiar with uh, subnets on Avalanche or uh, parachains in the, in, the, uh, in the Polkadot world, they can maybe see some of the similarities in design uh, that we are going for over here with, with hyperchains. Great, thank you. And how do you see hyperchains on stacks um, maybe competing or in comparison to other L1s out there? Yeah, so I, I don't uh, see them as a um, as com competing with L1s. I think people, just like when people think about Avalanche, they don't really think of Avalanche and the different subnets. They just think of Avalanche as a uh, as an as a ecosystem or a blockchain, right? So I think of these as like optional layers on stacks. So people don't have to use a hyperchain, like the main chain is enough uh, for you. It has all the functionality. If you just want to use the main chain, great. But uh, for if you need higher scalability, so there might be certain applications where you know part of the application is deployed on a hyperchain. Or as I said, a mint is a great example. If you want to participate in a mint and that mint is happening on a hyperchain, then you kind of like need to have your assets there to be able to participate there. But, but in general, we, you can think of that as a uh, faster transactions layer that is that basically uh, that the Stacks ecosystem can benefit from, and Stacks itself is is kind of like a programming layer on Bitcoin, right? So it's it's a little bit like there you can see the trend here that we are trying to scale everything as layers around Bitcoin, uh, which is uh, is a little bit like you know if you think about the internet, the internet has different layers, right? So the base layer is kind of like TCP/IP. Then someone kind of like built like the World Wide Web on top, and people started building like other other things on top of it. So we view Bitcoin as kind of like the the foundational layer, uh, stacks as the programming layer, and then hyperchains is really adding the the ultra fast transactions there. Excellent.
And we'll share more resources below, but could you give a rough timeline? Yes, so I think the, um, the hero has put up a rough timeline of like when the testnet is launching, I believe it's roughly April, and then they're looking at uh, basically in stages, they're, they're looking at like, okay, by this time you'll have like this feature set online because developers can like start playing around with it as soon as the testnet is live, right? And I think the power of open source communities and, and decentralized ecosystems is that anyone can actually contribute to the code base and, uh, and, and, and push it forward faster if you want to. And I know that at Trust Machines, we would definitely be uh, looking at resources that can help contribute to the Hyperscape project because we, we see that as very beneficial to some of the applications we're working at. And I'm pretty sure there will be other developers out there as well uh, who would really welcome uh, uh, this, this work because I think the number one thing that I've been hearing uh, after we saw a, a lot of growth in stacks last year was the and the transaction speeds and and the uh, the bottlenecks around mempool and so on. So it's I think it's, in, it's safe to say that this is the number one pain point that a lot of developers and users have experienced. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a bunch of other startups out there and developers they want to contribute to hyperchains and kind of like accelerate the timeline. Yeah.